Hello, and welcome to another episode of Choo Choo is a Ranker. And on this episode, we are going to be discussing the discography of the British art pop phenom, Kate Bush. Hailing from the county of Kent in England, Kate was signed to EMI at the tender age of 19, after catching the ear of the Pink Floyd guitarist David Gilmour, who helped Bush record her first demo tapes. And she came roaring out of the gates, with her debut single, Wuthering Heights, rocketing to the top of the UK singles chart, making her the first female ever to hit number one with a song both written and performed by the artist. Her lightning quick ascent was a bit too much for Kate though, and she recoiled away from the business somewhat, retiring from playing live after just one tour, and switching her focus to making studio-based off-kilter art rock that often saw her at loggerheads with the record label. But in a time dominated by vacuous plastic pop, Kate Bush was a genuine, uncompromising artist and went on to become incredibly influential, gaining universal respect and a lofty critical standing. And as for my own fandom, well it's a casual one. I had heard the majority of her 70s and 80s work coming into this and had mostly enjoyed it, so I'm looking forward to catching up on the records that I don't know. And speaking of the records, I'm only going to be ranking her core 9 studio albums. I'm excluding the re-recorded packages such as the Director's Cut for example. So without further ado, let's be complete rankers and rank up a storm. These are the studio albums of Kate Bush ranked from worst to best. So, we're going to be kicking off this list with 50 Words for Snow from 2011, which was Kate's ninth and most recent LP to date. And here we have a mostly stripped back piano based album that is also kind of a concept album about the winter. It only has 7 songs on it, but still clocks in at 1 hour and 5 minutes, which of course means that a lot of the songs are pretty damn long. And to be honest, there's not a whole lot to really say about this album. It's very relaxing and beautiful and does have a nice ambient groove, but on the flip side, It's not really engaging, or even particularly interesting, it's just very pleasant background noise, and that's all. And the songs themselves all feel very samey. In fact, the only track that really stands out is Wild Man, with its Vangelis style synth editions and livelier pace, and that's simply by the virtue of it sounding a bit different to the others. Even a duetting Elton John on Snowed In at Wheeler Street fails to really rouse the record out of its comfortable slumber. So yeah, I mean this isn't a bad album, but it is a specific thing for a specific time. Within the goals that the record sets itself, I think it's fairly successful, but it's just not as interesting or as dynamic as Kate's other albums. Three stars. Next up, we have The Kick Inside, which was Kate's debut LP from 1978. And yeah, it's certainly controversy time, as The Kick Inside is largely considered as a classic and one of the more notable records within her discography. And there are some cool things about the record. Firstly, the production. The album sounds fantastic. It has a rich and warm 1970s rock production that is in stark contrast to the more sterile style that would come to define Kate's work from the 80s. And secondly, the mega hit Wuthering Heights, which is undeniably great. The iconic melody, the skyscraping chorus, and the insane high notes that she hits is just wonderful stuff. But for me, that's it. Nothing else on this comes even remotely close to recapturing the excellence of Wuthering Heights. The album feels like that one hit and 12 other mediocre songs. This is Kate still in an embryonic state and still searching for her own stamp of uniqueness. Other minor highlights include the opening moving, which immediately shines a light on Kate's absurdly beautiful voice, with a strangely spectral backing tune. The man with a child in his eyes is a nicely played and sung piano ballad, as is the closing title track, The Kick Inside. Oh To Be In Love has a wispy performance from Kate and a thick warm bass line, while Them Heavy People has a twee fluttering catchiness to it. But on the flip side, tracks like The Saxophone Song, Strange Phenomena, Le Amour Looks Something Like You and Feel It are slickly produced but completely unmemorable. They lack any kind of interesting hook or substance. 
So yeah, I mean, I'm certain this won't be a popular placing for this particular LP. Most people do seem to like it a lot more than I do. And I don't dislike it as such. Indeed, that great production, the inclusion of Wuthering Heights and Kate's always intoxicating voice buoy this up to three stars for me. But I still don't love it. Next up we have Lionheart, which was Kate's second LP, also from 1978. And this album was born out of record company pressure, as they turned up the heat on Kate to capitalise on the success of her debut. A lot of the songs on this are older songs that Kate wrote prior to the ones featured on the kick inside, as she didn't have enough time to create a fresh batch within such a short turnover. The result of which does indeed feel like a bit of a hastily thrown together assortment of leftovers, to the point where Kate herself outright dismisses the record. I have a slightly kinder outlook on the album myself. Whilst there's nothing on here as good as Wuthering Heights, I still feel like a lot of the songs on this are more interesting than the ones on the kick inside. They're a little bit kookier and a little bit more unique, one incremental step closer to the batshit crazy Kate Bush that was just around the corner. Fun times on this includes Wow, which has a slick and catchy pop sensibility to it. That simple but hooky chorus is delightfully thrifty. The horrendously titled Don't Push Your Foot on the Heartbreak has a good energy to it and a growling performance from Bush, as well as some highly amusing backing vocals. Oh England, My Lion Heart has a flighty patriotic tweeness about it that appeals. Coffee Home Ground has a pumping pantomime element, while Closer Hammer Horror is fantastic going all in with the theatricality, with Kate prowling around the chorus like a ghoulish monster. Sadly, most of the other tracks feel a bit half-baked, they could have certainly done with a bit more time in the oven. That said, I wouldn't say any of them are bad either, they're just pleasantly ignorable. So yeah, this is Kate at perhaps her most throwaway, but for me, there's just more songs on this that I enjoy than on the debut, and thus the ranking goes in its favour. Three stars. Coming up next we have The Red Shoes from 1993, which was Kate's 7th LP and last before she departed for 12 years of radio silence. And here we find Kate Bush at her most direct and pop orientated, almost entirely foregoing the more obtuse art style of her 80s work, possibly with the aim of finding wider commercial success. Unfortunately though, Kate's slightly out of step on this record. The majority of her work feels trendsetting, on the edge of the avant-garde pop scene, leading the charge towards the future. Conversely, this LP from 1993 feels steadfastly stuck in 1986. The more built-up pop numbers on the album feel notably dated. Tracks like the opening single cut, Rubber Band Girl, Constellation of the Heart and Why Should I Love You definitely fall foul of the old overcooked 80s synth pop disease. Rubber Band Girl is certainly the best of the three and at least partially redeems itself via Kate's amusing vocal yelps. Why Should I Love You frustrates no end because there is a lovely tune buried beneath all the 80s gunk. While Constellation of the Heart is just a bad song, poorly written, badly executed, I think it might well be Bush's very worst album track. However, when she steers the ship away from the more overtly synth-heavy pop numbers, she starts to knock out some home runs. Her collaboration with Eric Clapton and So Is Love has a nice laid-back pastoral element to it, and Clapton's easy guitar licks certainly don't hurt the track either. Eat the Music has a tinkering, upbeat Caribbean vibe and some gonzo lyrics like Put a mango seed in your mouth and pull a plum out. Hey, I'll pull out my plums for you anytime, Kate. Uh, Moments of Pleasure is one of her very best piano ballads, with its beautiful string section and cascading set of lyrics that repeatedly catch the attention. While the Song of Solomon is a sensual synth dirge with the memorable chorus of I don't want your bullshit, I just want your sexuality. Man, I mean, I tell you, I've never wanted to be a manure salesman so much in my entire damn life. But there's still more good material on the back end. Title track The Red Shoes has a nice Celtic flavoured stomp. Top of the City has a glowering urbane mood and some cool lyrical imagery. While Big Stripey Lie impresses with squalling, discordant guitars and an achingly lonely cello line. It's the one proper callback to her art rock days. 
So yeah, this is a bit of a mixed bag. Some of Kate's worst songs are on here, and at 55 minutes long, it does stray into over length. But the good still far outweighs the bad on this. 3.5 stars. Next up, we have Never Forever, which was Kate's third LP from 1980. Despite being one of the most overlooked and undersold records in her discography, it's here that the extremely weird art pop version of Kate Bush that most people love was properly birthed. This is a fun, madness-tinged record with lots of delightfully odd twists and turns. That said, Kate's still in the process of firing up here, and not everything entirely lands. Tracks like Delius and Blow Away feel rhythmically straightjacketed and a bit half-baked, while the likes of All We Ever Look For and Closer Breathing feel tethered to Lionheart's throwaway nature. But when this album gets things right, it really starts to cook. Opener Babushka kicks things off with a classic, combining pantomime catchiness and Bush's trademark eccentricity, and the music video for it is also pretty unforgettable. Egypt has a fun cavorting synth line and ear-catching lyrics like My Pussy Queen Knows My Secrets. <laughs> and you'll never know how hard it is not to make another filthy joke here. But the track has a really cool outro with synths that mirror the sound of screaming eagles. The wedding list is pure insanity with its stuttering composition framing some highly amusing murder-soaked lyrics. Violin is so much damn fun with its wild vocals and punky growl. The Infant Kiss is a piano ballad that stands out due to some slightly disturbing lyrics about sexual awakening, while Army Dreamers has an instant easy pop catchiness and a delightfully folky nature. Not to mention a percussion section comprised of locking and loading rifles and Kate's hilariously country bumpkin accent that she uses for the song. So yeah, whilst this album has a handful of weak spots, it's mostly great and sets Bush upon the path to her greatest works. 3.5 stars. Coming in next, we have The Sensual World from 1989, which was Kate's sixth LP. And if the previous entry indicated the start of Kate's batshit crazy golden period, then this album signals the end of it, as she turns her attention to more elegant soundscapes, and makes an LP full of smooth ballads with some new age overtones. And yeah, this was a difficult one to place, because it's a difficult album. This is a record that will pay dividends if you give it your full attention and sink yourself into it, but won't give you an inch as a casual listen. If your attention wanders, even for a moment, you'll be kicked out faster than that drunken grabby hands man at the local Hooters. As for the songs themselves, yeah, this is a pretty consistent set. The only real weak spots are Heads We're Dancing, which is a blustery synth-pop number that lacks a substantial hook, and Never Be Mine, which is perhaps one subtle ballad too many and doesn't particularly stand out. But everything else on this is solid. Opener and title track The Central World is great. I love its Asian motif and the opening church bells, and it has an alluringly sultry vibe to it as Kate sings about eating cake directly from her mouth and getting in between her breasts. Oh, Delali! I mean, hey, who wouldn't like to take a tumble in Kate's bush? Ah, uh, low-hanging fruit, my friend. And now we're back to plums again. It could have been worse, though. You know, I could have made a cake bush joke. <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway, Love and Anger is a rollicking track with its choral vocals, thickly laid production, jumbled rhythm, and emotive melody. The Fog has these great warm pastoral synths on it and a statico violin that sounds like it's lost out in the spectral ether. Deeper Understanding mixes New Age vibes with lyrics about technology, which is likely a purposeful juxtaposition, and I like the track's gently lapping pulse. Rocket's Tail has an interesting flow with its layered vocal intro leading into an atmospheric rock explosion. It's pretty damn cool. While Closer, this woman's work is arguably Kate's best ever song. It's an unbelievably touching and ethereally beautiful piano ballad, which I assume is about dealing with cancer. I mean, the track is just an absolute masterpiece. Mwah. Chef's kiss and a couple of cheers for that one. It is awesome. So yeah, although not the easiest or most accessible Kate Bush album, this is still more than worthwhile of the patience needed to get the most out of it. Four stars. Thank you. 
Next up, we have Ariel from 2005, which was Kate's eighth LP and her first for 12 years after The Red Shoes from 1993. And here we have a bulging double album that clocks in at one hour and 20 minutes in length and sees Kate indulging in the new age elements of her sound. There's a very pastoral, ambient and bucolic sense about this record, especially on the second half. And to that end, it's pertinent to note that this album is indeed split into two distinct halves. The first half is home to more traditionally structured pop songs, while the second half has a more freeform ambient bent to it. And yeah, both halves are great and maintain a consistent quality. Moreover, seeing as Kate has given these compositions time to breathe, they take on a sense of depth and mystery, which is pretty alluring and a good hook for repeat listens. High spots on a relaxing and cohesive LP include the opening King of the Mountain, which combines a laid-back synth groove with a catchy chorus and a nice lyrical tribute to Elvis Presley. Mrs. Bartolozzi is a stripped-back piano ballad that completely sucks you in with Kate's lyrics about domestic chores. How to Be Invisible is a great slickly pulsing tune with a brooding atmosphere and badass lyrics like I found a book on how to be invisible, on the edge of the labyrinth, under a veil you must never lift. Cool. An Architect's Dream is a beautifully smooth synth tune that really reminds me of Ryuichi Sakamoto. Rest in peace Sakamoto-san. Summer in Between has a synth effect that sounds like waves cresting onto the shoreline. It's another expertly judged exercise in relaxation without dipping into boredom while the final two tracks bring some more Obey Neon Soaked vibes to the table. Nocturne with its snaking nighttime glide and a title track Ariel with its steadily building dance beats. So yeah, this is a great late period return to form for Kate Bush. Whilst her subsequent album, 50 Words for Snow, felt a bit meandering, this LP strikes a perfect balance of relaxation and engagement. It's great stuff from top to bottom. Four stars. Next up, we have 1982's The Dreaming, which was Kate's fourth LP. And here we have the most odd and idiosyncratic album of Bush's career. And it's wonderful. There's almost a total lack of normalcy on this record. Every track has some really strange or off-kilter element to it, which in turn makes the album tons and tons of fun from start to finish. And the production on this LP is also great. Whilst it might lack the thick warmth of the 70s albums, it replaces it with an incredibly layered sound, full of little background details that are easy to miss on first listen, but a lot of fun to pick through on subsequent spins. Highlights on a purposely obtuse yet delightful record include the inscrutable synth pop of the opener Sat in Your Lap. There Goes a Tenor is a fun bit of Cockney vaudeville that confirms Kate Bush as a Peter Gabriel era Genesis fan. Put Out the Pin is an insanely catchy and avant garde pop tune with some memorable screen vocals from Kate in the chorus. Title track The Dreaming defies any type of logical explanation, with its utterly bizarre Australian accents and lyrics that I'm not even sure qualify as abstract, while Night of the Swallow slowly builds into a fiddle-strewn Celtic pop stomper. But still, the hits, they just keep on rolling. All the Love has a ghostly emotional quality to its somber piano dirge. Houdini is a gorgeous classical piano, synth pop and baroque chamber pop piece with guttural screaming interludes. It's totally nuts, but it's amazing. While Closer, Get Out of My House, at one point has Kate and a male guest singer braying like a donkey. And that's not a joke. I'm not making this shit up. <laughs> I swear. But for me, though, the ultimate highlight is the track Suspended in Gaffer, which is magnificent with this insanely catchy, uniquely English pop shuffle, replete with an oddly moving chorus, where the melody pulls an undefinable sadness out of the tune, which is admirable considering the fact that I have no fucking idea what being suspended in gaffer means. Although I'm fairly sure I could make some filthy jokes about it, but out of respect for Kate, I'm just going to gaffer up my cake hole. So yeah, this is Bush at her weirdest and most avant-garde, but impressively, she doesn't lose an inch of her catchiness on this. The Dreaming is a textbook example of how to make an immediately accessible, yet fundamentally weird art pop record. Five stars. So here we are at the top of the mountain and the Kate Bush gold medal goes to Hounds of Love, which was her fifth LP from 1985. 
Now Kate's previous album, and indeed previous entry, The Dreaming, was excellent, but was left bereft of commercial success. The general public of 1982 just wasn't into it. So Kate's record label put pressure on her to make some more commercially viable material, and Kate capitulated in the perfect way, making an album of two halves, a first side comprised of the most pinpoint precise pop songs she ever put to tape, and a second side comprised of the avant-garde dark-hearted art suite The Ninth Wave, which is about being lost at sea with the constant fear of drowning ever present. And yeah, Kate just knocked both sides out of the fucking park, creating an all-time masterpiece that was both instantly accessible but also willfully obtuse. And there's something really badass and punk rock about that almost flippantly giving the company what they want without losing a shred of artistic integrity and taking things to an even deeper extreme at the same time. Mwah. Chef's kiss to Kate Bush for just being able to stick it to the man in such an unassailably cool way. And as for highlights, well, pick a weak spot. Eh, trick question, there isn't one. Side 1 kicks things off with the badass rolling electric toms of Running Up That Hill, which is a song about swapping gender identities a theme that has become tiresomely prevalent in our modern society. I mean, hey, I'm libertarian, do whatever makes you happy, that's my philosophy in life, just don't bore me by constantly banging on about it. Anyway, Running Up That Hill got a much publicised new lease of life due to the Netflix series Stranger Things in recent times, topping the charts in multiple countries, which is cool and I'm really glad that Kate's music is managing to cross the generation divide because of it. Title track Hounds of Love, meanwhile, is one of the most gloriously hook-ready pop songs that Kate ever recorded. I love the subtly sad undercurrent of the track. The Big Sky is also a magnificent pop single, with its rumbling bass, clattering drum rhythm and Kingsian melody. Mother Stands for Comfort has these eerie synths that gives the track a really dark and mournful texture, which is fitting as the lyrics allude to a loyal mother hiding her child's murderous tendencies. Cloud Bursting is another banger, with its faux strings giving the track an epic, elegant quality, and the building drum patterns bringing the excitement. Well, and Dreamer's Sheep is an exceptionally beautiful piano ballad that captures an alluringly sleepy feel to close out side one. Getting into the details of side two and the ninth wave is an exercise in futility, as most of it is atmospheric texturing that defies the limits of vocabulary, but highlights on the supremely cohesive sequence includes Under the Ice, which kicks things off with a sinister synth tune about dying in icy water. Waking the Witch thrums with a violent darkness, the sudden bursts of distorted drums leaping out to disturb your calm. Jig of Life is an energetic and fun bit of thundering Irish trad art rock, which brings a cool dynamism to the end of the record. While Closer, Morning Fog ends the album with a simple pop tune that feels like taking a breath of fresh air after being underwater for a long time. So yeah, as catchy as it is obscure, Hounds of Love is the quintessential Kate Bush release. It gets an all-time level 5-star rating and is my pick for her very best record. And now we've come to the end of our deep dive, the question remains. Did I gain more appreciation for the artist? And the answer is, maybe, slightly. It's difficult because I already knew Kate's best work, and the stuff that I didn't know ranged from mediocre to pretty good. But I guess both The Dreaming and Hounds of Love gain in their appreciation from me, so as I said, yeah, I gain just a little bit more appreciation for Kate Bush, and I'm happy with my conclusions for this week. And that's it, that's my list. Of course, that won't be your list, so please sound off in the comments section to tell me how you'd rank these records. Like, share, subscribe, and all that other kind of YouTube jazz. Feel free to check out the Kate Bush playlist I personally curated, link in the description below. Make sure to take care of yourself, but most importantly, just keep on ranking. Ranking.